Hi, this is David Bernstein. I'm the founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, and this is the Jewish Contrarians podcast. Now, you're used to seeing me here if you're the if you're watching this on YouTube and not listening to it on your favorite podcast uh, listening app. Um, you're used to seeing and hearing uh, Brandy Shafatinsky, my normal partner in thought crime. Brandy is uh, on travel in California, battling the evil forces of radical ethnic studies. So I have a very suitable substitute this week, uh, also uh, a, a new colleague, Rabbi Mark Cohen. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi Cohen, or Mark, I'm going to call him Mark here, um, is uh, the JILV's rabbinic liaison, but he's also our director of leadership development. So um, if you're interested in and being involved at a higher level or supporting us financially, that's always welcome. Um, Mark's your guy. And um, and so please be in touch with us. Um, Mark at JILV.org. And that's Mark with a K. Mark, welcome. Thanks so much, David. Great to see you. Yeah. So Mark, I mean, maybe just take a second um, and tell us a little bit about yourself. You're, you're, you've are you're been a congregational rabbi most of your career. Um, what, what are you doing? What are you doing these days? Oh, I just hang out and play guitar on occasion when I get a chance. Shovel shovel snow when it's snowing. Um, I am starting now um, in this part-time capacity with the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values. I also have a, a synagogue in Connecticut as well. I've been a pulpit rabbi for a little about 25 years. Um, yeah, that's me in, in a quick nutshell. I am was intrigued by and um, interested in the JLV now for a couple of years since I've known you, David. Um, and it's really the nature of the work of what we're doing here that has compelled me. Um, I'm grateful to be a part of the staff. Yeah, Mark's a great heterodox thinker, like probably all of you are, who's interested in making sure that we have viewpoint diversity inside and outside the Jewish community. I know I'm speaking for you, Mark, but um, I know that because we talk. Um, well, and I and I do, and I, I tend to be the, the one in the room. When, when the room is going one direction, I'm going to go the other direction. Yeah, well, that's why you're on the Contrarian podcast. We want we we're looking good. for that. Good. So you can put something out there, and I'll make sure to run the other direction. Okay, good. We'll do that. Um, so um, also, Mark's in a uh, in a tie, as you'll see, and I'm in sweatshirts. Mark doesn't is new he, around here, so he doesn't realize that we're we do dress down Fridays on the Contrarian podcast. But that's all right, Mark. Next that's time right. you'll know. Um, Thank you so much. All right. So. I don't know if I'm going to really do a monologue here because, uh, you know, sort of uh, M Mark is the featured guest, but I'm going to go into it a little bit. Um, we're here to talk about sort of the state of viewpoint diversity and Zionism in the rabbinate, conservative reform rabbinate. Um, and I might have gotten that backwards, I think, in the way we titled it, but that's OK. Um, so we're obviously the state of the rabbinate, how accepting it is of alternative viewpoints, how firmly Zionist it is, is um, a major factor for what the Jewish community is today and what it becomes. I mean, it's an important factor in Jewish life, right? If every rabbi is ideologically of one stripe or another, we're not going to have a very diverse Jewish community. Or we'll have a profoundly alienated Jewish community. Both of those things can be true, that we can have a segment of Jews who just simply severs their connection um, in Jewish life because they don't see themselves represented by their rabbis, by their synagogue communities and the like. So that's one aspect of this. And I think, you know, I worry that um, that, uh, that too many reform and conservative reconstruction of synagogues have become so ideologically monolithic that they've alienated large segments of the Jewish community. That's one thing that I'm sort of going to put on the table, Mark, when we get to it in a second. Yeah. The, the, um, the other thing is I worry that it, 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 it um, that with the leftward shift of uh, of the rabbis, you're also increasingly there's a louder and louder sort of either Zionism voice or or highly critical of Israel voice in the rabbinate and in the liberal movements, and also that's going to be alienating for some segment of American Jews, perhaps not others who might resonate to that. But again, it's not the direction I hope that our rabbis go in, and I don't want to see them uh, continue in that direction. And I think you're going to talk about some some perhaps worrying signs there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also, it's sort of the, what is the culture of Jewish life like? Um, are we, um, Dan, I think you've just taken me out of the picture. <laughs> Unless my camera just shut down. So David, I, I think your see. camera might have shut down. Okay, so um, I'm sorry about that. I don't know why that happened, but I, I'm going to you, you change. Speaking and I can just move my lips and then that would somehow, you know. 
Um, right. Let, okay. So start camera. Let's just start camera. Okay. I don't know why it did that, but I'm on a different camera now. All right. We'll, 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 we'll go with that. Um, you can see me. Um, so, um, what is the culture of Jewish life? Like, what is the culture of synagogue? Like, are we able to talk about multiple views Are sensitive topics essentially shelved by rabbis because a, they don't want to become too politicized that I understand, by the way, they may want to be more ideologically and politically neutral. So they stay away from certain topics or probably more commonly, they favor topics that are aligned with them ideologically mm -hmm. and, um, and then stay away from topics that they deem either problematic um, or off the, beyond the pale. And, you know, again, I've, I've experienced that a lot. We've experienced that a lot of JLV where you have rabbis that are very politically motivated and they really are stifling multiple points of view, and they don't want to see their communities discuss more than one perspective on, let's say, anti-racism, and so they they stack the deck in that way. Um, so those are those are some of the problems in our mind. And then, of course, we're in the post-October 7th moment, and um, we're trying to ask, who are we as American Jews? What is our community's profile going to be? Are we supporting Israel? Are we a, a staunchly Zionist community? Or are we moving in the other direction? Are we afraid of the moral implications of war. Um, and um, and so anyway, those are some of the things on my mind. So Mark, I guess I'm going to ask the, this question to you. What do you think the state of the rabbinate is now, the liberal rabbinate? When we know Orthodox Judaism, what is the state of the liberal rabbinate around viewpoint diversity and Zionism? And I'll let you take that in whatever order you, you wish. Fair enough. So, and, and let it just be known that I do not speak for any of the movements. I am, I am but one person, though I think I have a view of different um, perspectives. I don't know what the state is right now because we are, unfortunately, Zionism has become, as we saw it potentially happening, Zionism has become such a divisive issue. And to me, Zionism is inherently part of being Jewish. And so I can't even get my head around the idea of, of people who would call themselves, and rabbis, who would call themselves a non-Zionist or an anti-Zionist. And I think there's also an eight, there's both a, a movement difference as you go from conservative reform, reconstructionist. There's also an age difference. So for those of us who are in the kind of 50 years old and older, we're of a per certain perspective. And then the younger crowd feels a little differently. It is, um, it is tragic to me that you can go on, on reform synagogue websites and you have to hunt for where it says anything about Israel. There's all kinds of social justice, social action, and I am in favor of doing good social justice and social action work. But to try to find a statement or a perspective, an Israeli flag that will be around, it, it is shocking to me. Um, I see some of my colleagues who are um, un literally have been going to Israel, have been very vocal in supporting Israel during this time, and other colleagues who are um, backing a ceasefire. Now, in many ways, I would love nothing more than for all the fighting to end and for us to be able to move on to kind of whatever is going to be next. But the, the, the rancor that shows up in communications, now some of this is on social media and, and people do not present their best on social media, but um, the kind of divisiveness of people who, who either are very much in favor of the ceasefire, are very much opposed, and they're, you're kind of in one camp or the other. And that that doesn't bode well for us. Um, yeah. So that, Can I, I want to I want to push on one one thing please. that you mentioned for a second. So you mentioned that you're in favor of social action, social justice, and so forth for, for synagogues. And I want to what I want to ask about that is that what does that mean to you? And, and here's what I mean by that. Look, let's say your congregation on Christmas Day d decides to go to a homeless shelter and uh, or a soup kitchen and. And, and give soup to homeless people. That, that's completely, in my view, non-ideological. Like a, a political conservative could absolutely participate in that. Um, and yet so often when I'm seeing coming in the out of the name of social justice and tukun olam and the like from, from synagogues is ideologically tinged. It, 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 it's, it's not just, you know, serving people. It's not helping people necessarily. It's about anti-racism and, and so forth. And it's very specific and very policy oriented. There was a social justice Torah commentary that was written by the, um, a, a rabbi in the reform movement. And there were, there were various essays in it. And, you know, he's very explicit about what he means by that. It's not, it's not ideology free. What is your, what is your, when you say it, what do you mean? So it is much to, to my mind, it is a much safer bet to go and staff the homeless shelter 
than it is to go and lobby your Congress person on what policies are going to help remove the reality for a need for homeless shelter. And what's happened, I think, in our synagogues is if we take, we need to give people a place to be or food for the meal or whatever it is. When we go and we lobby, now we're taking a policy position and now we've just divided the congregation potentially. Because even though, say, in a reform setting, if maybe 75% of the congregation feels a particular way, well, you've just alienated that 25%. And and now now what do we do? And it's it's become my feeling that we need to stay away from that divisiveness when it comes to policy, because somehow at the end of the day, we need to be able to take care of each other. And if we've gotten so angry at one another over policy approaches, then we, we lose the chance to be a community. And that's right. that's not going to be all right. Yeah. A a Angela Buckdahl talks about the role of a rabbi of either being priest or prophet. Obviously, it can be both. And that the priestly rabbi is weaving the the fabric of community and the prophet is, you know, moralizing and that, that she feels that the, the balance has tipped in favor of, um, of the prophetic voice within the liberal congregations and not enough, too much prophet, not enough priest. And it leads to this idea of what, what has been labeled as the tikkun olam Jew, where the person is far more involved with whatever the social realities are of this moment but far less in, in the rites and the rituals and the knowledge base of what we need in order to be and to do Jewish, which is, if I can, bridge into this idea a little bit about universal in particular. That I think uh, yes, but one second. I want to put, what, yeah. before you get there, I have one more, one more thing that emerged out of your, your, your last answer. Um, you know, we're talking about direct action, okay? But I've heard synagogues talk about um, being sanctuary synagogues for undocumented immigrants who come and they're providing sanctuary and you could say, okay, some, I'm sure the rabbi would say, I'm just, we're just performing that service function, just like the soup kitchen. But others would say, wait a second, that is actually an ideological statement in and of itself. I'm opposed to illegal immigration. I think our borders need to be controlled. And so therefore, when you do that you're do, and do it on my behalf as a member of the synagogue, mm. you're, you're making a value statement that I think is um, out of sync with um, with with my understanding of the situation, what do you think about something like that? Boy, that's a tough one. I, I look. I'm at, I'm trying to imagine if I had a synagogue and I was in San Diego or I was, I was on a border community somewhere, and there are people who need food. My instinct is to feed to feed the hungry. That literally, yes. that is one of our commandments to do. Yeah. The policy and how that person got there that is a much larger issue. Um, and we're going to have, we're going to have disagreement about that. Yeah. I but sanctuary, sanctuary congregations are not just about providing the direct service. It's about shielding people. It's about giving mm -hmm. them, let's say housing that would shield them and to protect their anonymity or whatever, so that they're not, they're not deported. And that's a different function in some ways than just, uh, making and just sure giving somebody a meal. I hear, yeah. I hear what you're saying and I, I don't have the magic answer on that. Um, other than I would hate for a congregation to become divided because, we politically have different have different opinions on it. Yeah. 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 So okay. So universal in particular. I mean, you know, Judaism in some ways is is about navigating that tension between universal and particular. What are you what are you seeing? So I heard a colleague once give a great sent, sentence, which was um, we are a particular people with a universal message. And that that's very much in keeping with how I, I think I live mm -hmm. my life. What what this moment has demanded, certainly since October 7th, I believe, is really honing in on the particular message. It doesn't mean that we we fail to be concerned about Palestinians and, and suffering that's going on, mm -hmm. but it means we need to take care of ourselves. It, it, is, the, it is the proverbial line of when, when you're on the airplane and the oxygen mask drops first and you have to put yours on first. I remember when I was a new parent, I'm like, wait a second, shouldn't I take care of my kid first? You have to take care of your first of, of yourself first. Mm -hmm. And I think for many in the non-Orthodox world, we get very skittish because, wait a second, does that mean we don't care about somebody else? No, we can care about somebody else, but we, we ha our brothers and sisters are literally have been dying. They're fighting to defend our people's land and to turn our backs would be is, is the worst thing that we could possibly do. Um, there was a, a letter that has come out that, um, by people who are former um 
they're former campers or leaders in the reform movement. Um, they grew up in the reform movement, and they issued a, a pretty harsh letter to the Union for Reform Judaism saying that the URJ is not doing enough and it needs to be very active in calling for a ceasefire. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe that the reform movement is solidly with Israel and, is, and has been supportive, although there might be some language that I would change, do a little bit of this, but by and large, the reform movement stands with Israel. We certainly stand with our, our colleagues, my, my reform uh, colleagues who are there and whose children are in the army, some of my colleagues who are literally serving. And so to see reform Jews stand up and, and not just do nothing, but to call out and say that the reform movement is not doing enough. And then, of course, there are those who are further to the left in organizations like the Jewish Voice for Peace that are just outwardly anti-Zionist, unabashedly anti-Zionist, anti-Israel. It's just, to me, it is just devastating to see. Yeah. Yeah. You know, by the way, I'm sure some percentage of those young or those people who signed that letter that you just mentioned probably would argue that they are doing it or they see themselves doing it in Israel's best interest, that they just believe that Israel itself, not just leave alone the Palestinians, should have a ceasefire and that this would help bring the hostages home. I'm sure they construct a case for that, would they not? I will is gentle. I mean, yes and no. I, I um I learned a great expression this past week, which was as a Jewism. Yes, yes. Just like that, you to know. find out what is it? To, what does that mean? Right. So, as a Jew, you know, we learned in the Reform movement to take care of our brothers and sisters, or those who are in need, and therefore, it is from that perspective that I want to make sure to take care of Palestinians. And it's it's throwing in our face that what what happens, and unfortunately, um, people will grab little lines from Torah and use it how they need. B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God is, is, is a popular favorite um, and say, well, we need to do this. Yes, we do need to take care of those who are suffering. And when we think about the Palestinians in Gaza, well, who's this? who do you blame for that? Is that Israel's fault or how about Hamas? There's no language about blaming Hamas and noting that the, the where the terror comes from. Um, and so that, that kind of as a Jew, as a Jew, I believe, and therefore um right we're, we're shooting ourselves in our own foot yeah yeah we probably should all be careful about that and you could argue that at times we're doing that too although i i think we're less explicit about about it you know are we saying as a jew we support israel as a jew we support the israeli government's need to defend its people from hamas terror I don't know. Are we doing the same or are we just leaving out the phrase because we think it's an obnoxious phrase? So I try to be very careful because when I um, I don't want to say Judaism says, I can't. Right. Judaism, Judaism does not say, or the Jewish people do not say any one thing. We can say, I can say there are texts in our tradition that lead us to believe. If I look, I mean, just off the top of my head, I mean, we have in our daily prayers the whole idea of Zion and, and the idea of God's presence being present in in zion um it is there are jewish texts that lead us towards uh affirming israel as our as our people's homeland <clears throat> um yeah. As we, well, yeah yeah so let me let me go a slightly different direction for a second sure. here because you know there's obviously we have this problem of, of jewish voices for peace and uh if not now and others um, and uh, someone called it the wicked son problem. You know, we had, on P Pesach, we have four sons or four children, and the, the wicked son is the one who sort of almost externalizes the Jewish people. I don't now. Some of the people in JVP and like will say, "No, I'm doing this out of my my from my Jewish uh, standpoint." But but be that as it may, what do we do with this wicked son? Do we um, do we? Do, you know, I think it was. Uh, Natan Sharansky and Gil Troy in a piece that they did for Tablet called them the un-Jews. Mm -hmm. um, and um, are they un-Jews? Are they Jews? Are they, to what degree should we validate them? To what degree should we invalidate them? How do we, how do we think about them? And, you know, look, this it's close to home for a lot of people. I mean, we, you know, we, we have kids, um, you know, or might be in their mid twenties and the like, and be at a certain place ideologically. So I, for a lot of people they're you know, when I talk about these issues, um, I, they're they're really really struggling because it hits home with them in a very personal manner. 
it's a hundred percent personal. It's a reality for us <clears throat> in many of our families. And we want to be careful. I, listen, you become Jewish by birth or by conversion. That's so it's not for me to judge, say to somebody, you're not a Jew because you believe, well, you're Jew, you're a Jew by birth or by conversion. Um, how you live that out, then that's going to, that reflects your, your sensibilities and your understanding of it. Um, I, I don't want to take anybody out from the Jewish people because of their beliefs. Um, the wicked son, I'm forever trying to defend the wicked son at the Seder table, right? And, and I love the artwork of the wicked, of the four children and how it gets depicted. The wicked son, though, is at the table. He is there. And that's the critical part. And when he asks the question, what does this mean to you? And the re the retort is, you know, because you said, what does it mean to you? And he didn't include himself in it. I look at the question as a legitimate question. What does this mean to you? And so it's it's not wicked to ask the question. What, what is potentially wicked or dangerous is to work against our own people and to stand with those who genuinely want our downfall. And so to come out um, and unabashedly embrace an anti-Israel standpoint um, is, is very dangerous for us. I would not rule those people out of the Jewish people. They are, we are all together. Um, but, but to try to work not to literally harm uh, your brother and sister. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there were these dueling letters that came out of alum from the Charles E. Smith Jewish Day School, where my older son graduated. My younger son spent some time there, too. Um, it started with a letter from very progressive Jews, probably not that different from the one that you just said was signed by a bunch of reform leaders um, who... Um, who called out their own school for teaching them a one-sided view of Israel and Zionism, um, who accused Israel. I don't know if they used the word genocide or not, but it was it was very, very harsh. And some of them said, some of us characterize Israel as a settler colonial state and others don't, which really got to me. That's the part yeah. that got to me more than anything else. Then there were a couple other letters that were that condemned the first one and stood with Israel in no uncertain terms. Now, the interesting thing here, if you look at the numbers, I don't remember the exact number, but the, the number of students or former students who signed that first letter was actually quite low, 40, 50, something like that. The other letters, you, it took me a while to scroll down. There were hundreds of signatures. And and it, it goes to show that maybe we, we – um, exaggerate the wicked mm -hmm. son problem in a way. I think there are some statistics here that show, yeah, yeah, it's a growing number of young Jews, but it's still not the dominant number. And I worry that some of our Jewish institutions are catering to the to that segment of our population. There, um, even if it's not quite the ones who distance themselves from Zionism, but they're still they're still orienting themselves with the assumption that young Jews are progressive, when many young Jews aren't. Uh, Michal Bitone, who's a young woman um, thinker, activist, she, I, I don't remember the exact organization she works for, but she runs this very dynamic minion in New York City. She yep. says that in her own experience, young Jews are much less progressive than we sort of stereotype them as. And and yes, that segment exists, but we're, we're overplaying it. What do you think? I, I'm so glad that you brought that up, and I'm a huge fan of, of Michal Bitone and her writing. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, if we just want to play statistics for a second, of the four children, the wicked one's only 25%. Yeah. Right? So present, but it's only a quarter, potentially, of what's there. Um, and that so often happens in discussions where the, the squeaky wheel is what we're paying attention to. And if we look on a kind of a linear scale and we think about the, you know, the extremes, it's maybe 10% on each side. And we could do that on any number of political issues in our country. Yes. 10% on each side, they're making all kinds of noise. About 80% really is more or less in a, in a similar space. And I, I, I think that there, first of all, there are, there are a lot of people who are behind Israel, Jews and non-Jews, but in our Jewish community, um, we just had someone um, speak in our synagogue who's a student at MIT um, who testified before Congress, and she was incredible. Um, in terms of the, the work that she's doing and other Jewish students on campus to combat the anti-Semitism and anti-Israel um, atmosphere. There are a lot of really positive voices and a lot of people who do want to see 
nuance and the complexity and, and stay away from the these slogans that people put up on social media, wherever it is, and recognize, no, we need to have genuine discussions with one another. And um, and if if a statement comes out that is talking with such language as set, settler colonialism and genocide, they're completely, I mean, that's just language that, as we know, despite what's happening in front of the Hague right now, it's ahistorical and wrong. Yeah. And so let, let's like let's come back into um what what the the truth based or the reality based world uh, mm -hmm. that Jonathan exactly. Rauch talks about and, and you know let, what's the reality here? Now we can have a conversation. Right. And there might be some diversity of view, even a wide range of diversity of view within that structure of reality, but at least we're we're having it on that basis. That's um, exactly right. I, I want to hit one other point, and we have to finish exactly at 12.30 Eastern time. So, um, you know, we're, we're talking about Zionism a lot, and I understand why, obviously, with all that's going on. But we also... Um, we also are dealing with sort of anti-racism and DEI and diversity, equity, inclusion in the movements. That's a very hot topic right now. I mean, yeah. we've talked a lot about it on this podcast. I'm writing a long piece about it that should be out shortly. And um, and and we're we're gonna be talking more and more with our own community about DEI and where we stand on it. And we I think we would argue that the the sort of standard fair coercive DEI is problematic and it's it's stifling of alternative views and it's ideal, it's it breeds resentment, blah, 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 blah. Um, and yet you see this particularly in the reform movement. I mean, I, there's a diversity program for rabbis and cantors that talks about disrupting daily acts of whiteness. Um, and, um, it is, it is actually an extreme version of DEI being taught by URJ, um, to rabbis. Now I'm not saying that, that every reform rabbi, but obviously not, that's ridiculous, buys into it. And we had a letter that was signed by 250 rabbis that warned about the dangers of this ideology setting into Jewish life. So we know that there's probably a lot more than that, that didn't sign that letter that would agree and don't participate. They vote with their feet by not participating in those trainings. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet that's the official line by, by, by putting that out. That's the official line of the reform movement. I've also seen a survey that the reform movement recently put out to, to congregants and the like that um, that was very DEI oriented and talked about equity and equitable representation and used the same kind of language and formulation of Ibrahim X. Kendi in, in his understanding of equity. What do you think, where, where are we on that, Mark? Boy, that is a huge question. Um, I'm really worried because I, I actually took a recent survey that the URJ put in. I couldn't believe all the boxes, all of the all of the, the divisions, and I thought, aren't, and this is going to sound remarkably naive. Um, aren't we just Jews? Like we we are we're already our own marginalized people, right? And and I I so worry about everyone with every title that is possible. And there's there's kind of this drilling down into how narrow can you go, but there's also an elevation of all those small things. And, yes. and it, it begins to normalize what, for lack of a better term, is the abnormal or, or is, is such a small percentage. It's not that there haven't been these differences, but we are, we are just Jews and we need to figure out how to work with one another and not compartmentalize in such, in such yeah. dangerous yeah. ways. I, I think that the thinking within DEI that's so flawed is they think that if you make these identity categories that explicit, you divide people up and let them talk to each other and talk about each other and so forth, that that's going to create more awareness and inclusion because you've now named the problem, which is oppression. And I, and well, look, I grew up in a, um, a, a, the, a Iraqi Jewish mother and a grandmother. We spoke Arabic. And I often felt that like, American Judaism was too Ashkenaz normative. It was too focused on the Ashkenaz experience and not enough on um, on the um, on the broad range of Jewish identities and, and Jewish experiences. Um, and yet, I don't want us to do it that way. Like, you don't need to. I don't need to have a DEI program for that. Just have some education about different ways Jews live, and let's talk about how you can make it a little. You know, you can bring in the hummus and not just the corned beef. You know, and, <laughs> that's exactly right. Just don't put one on top of the other. But exactly, it, it, there really is room for all of this. Um, it, we we can hold on to each other without having to take surveys and, and pigeonhole and and somehow subvert and say, well, as as a you know, and I and I embody, I, 
I am a straight man and I'm white and I am 100% Ashkenazi on both sides of my family. Okay, that doesn't mean I, I don't recognize or want to celebrate the, the very the many different shades of everything else. That right. we have. The next podcast we have I, that you're on, I'm going to challenge you about whether you should be white or not. I think you're male, definitely <laughs> male. But uh, but uh, I have to oh, end. Oh, I have to end. But uh, okay. listen, um, you know this is to be continued. Um, thank you for coming on, Mark. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. And we'll continue the conversation. Be well. Okay. Thanks.